past couple months is through our crowdsource website, through other ideas that have been submitted to us, we've narrowed it down to nine specific ideas that we're going to focus on today. So how many of you have been to Startup Weekend events before? Anybody here? So the, the afternoons for two or three hours each are going to be kind of modeled on that. It's a little bit different in the sense that they're actually going to have like a, they, they would probably have like an app or something that could be sold. But what we want to have by Monday morning for our pitch panel is a deliverable that we can present on specific ideas to the panel of judges. Along with that, you'll get more details from your facilitator. It's a two to, three, two to three page white paper about what your idea is, what your group came up with, and we're going to basically self-select into these groups. Um, the goal here is to take an idea, create an action plan around it, identify some of the antibodies that might come in and try to squash it, figure out a way to actually implement it, and then have something to go forth with. And if it's, if it's a compelling enough idea, you know, after death ends, have something you can take and do, and do something with in a self-organized way. So uh, Mark Jacobson, one of our uh, board members, has been working very hard over the past couple weeks to develop the, the, the framework. He's met with the facilitation lead, so there's nine of them, to talk to them about be facilitation best practices, getting <coughs> those going. Um, but what's going to happen is right now we're going to invite all these guys up to talk about their particular idea. So basically a three to four minute pitch on what they want to accomplish. And you, after this, will self-select into those groups and spend about two and a half hours today going through the initial brainstorming process, coming up with ideas, and figuring out a framework so that tomorrow you come back and actually put meat on that, on those ideas, and then go forth with it. Um, so Mark, do you want to add anything more about the concept or what we're looking to do here? Uh, no, not right now. I'll talk in a minute. Esteban, are you ready? Yeah. So feel free to chat about your idea and inform your team. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Esteban Castellanos. I am uh, a reservist. I left active duty about a year and a half ago. Um, and in my last year and a half of soul searching what to do next, um, I kind of stumbled upon this idea, uh, which is how great it would have been uh, for me, I think, to have had an opportunity to have an externship while I was in the Air Force. So the Air Force has a lot of professional development programs that uh, are expected of most uh, young officers. are supposed to go to squadron officer school, which is like a four to six week long program where you learn a lot of like team building skills. But what you don't walk away with is it any idea of how to bring your great ideas and being all fired up about some way in which you can <coughs> change uh, your environment. They, they don't give you any kind of catalyst. They don't teach you how to implement a change inside of this, uh, you know, inside of an organization that has so much inertia, like the military. Um, so uh, th then I thought about, well, so the Air Force forces people to do this, which is, it's fine. And then they also offer things such as language immersion. So it's a month long paid trip to somewhere around the world. I know several people who've done this, where you get to hone your skills, get to brush up, whatever. So I thought to myself, well, if they're paying for people to go learn languages somewhere, and we have to go to this um, squadron officer school, how about getting something a bit more out of it? Squadron officer school, to, to me, a lot of it seemed kind of like passive learning. You're sitting down a lot the whole time. Well, in an externship, we could actually be in the trenches with maybe some other organizations or companies where we can get a lot more hands-on learning about learning how to innovate and learning how to see how these new innovative ideas are injected into um, organizations. And maybe we can bring that experience, like a two to four month long experience, bring it back into active duty and you could say, hey, you know, we learned how to tackle these problems in such a manner. You can bring this new um, uh, skill set, basically, um, from all that hands-on learning that you've had. So um, on my soul search, I was turned out I was looking at business schools. And while sitting, meeting lots of people, I heard of something called Starting Block. And Starting Block is an institute. Um, it's held a few times a year all over the world. And they get a lot, a lot of like-minded people, who people who want to be innovators, people who want to have a social impact and add value to other people's lives. Um, and while I was there, I was taught how to be, how, taught how to innovate. And they also 
uh, walked us around Manhattan to different small organizations <laughs> that were doing really innovative things for relatively like things that you would consider pretty mundane sort of like personnel development. I saw a company there um, called PAVE that they they focus on the end result and they target like investing in certain people and what they want and how they want to develop them. Um, I, I thought that could be really useful, a really useful model for the military to consider um, for personnel development, among a handful of other things, um, such as uh, communications. I can't remember the name of the company, but a really innovative way to pass messages within an organization, like that can have a cultural impact on the uh, can change the ecosystem. Um, Anyways, a lot of really out of the box thinking, but um, ultimately, I think uh, you know the one common thread that I had there was I would hear so many people once they would meet me and they'd learn about me like, oh, you're in the military. They would make all these assumptions about who I am. They make all these positive <coughs> assumptions about military in general. We are innovators. We fill the gaps. We have initiative. We're all these things. And how great they would say, man, you know, we love that you're here. We would love, you know, people for you to come work with us. So I'm thinking to myself, well, why not? Why not go there? Why not raise our hand and say, hey, this is what I could do for you. What, tell me where I could help. And in, t in exchange, we could learn a whole new method of innovating and bring those ideas back into the military, into the active duty, and plant the seeds for the future leaders to kind of have a basically have a cultural change in the DNA and so that we would be more inclined to um, well accept innovative ideas uh, so please join this group if you have a lot of experience with internships or externships or connected well with people where we could help get um, current military into some of these organizations where we could learn and bring what we learn back into the military uh, into the active duty and um, and create an ecosystem that embraces innovative ideas, and um, that's it. Cool. All right, so uh, we'll have the name and the room number up here. We can go join that team uh, once we get complete. So next up is uh, Daryl. He's going to talk about uh, helping to prevent military suicide, some of the work he's done, and moving that uh, effort forward. Hi, good day, everyone. My name is Lieutenant Dipti. Uh, been here for about 15 years. And uh, I recently wrote a research paper on military mental health entitled Wicked Problems, Tackling Wicked Problems, Military Suicide, which I presented in Germany this past May. And that kind of snowballed into, into a lot of things, but, well, ending with me being here. But uh, what we're going to talk about today is some, a serious problem that's currently uh, we're dealing with in the military. So e each day, there's one military suicide in, throughout the U.S. military. And every hour, a U.S. veteran commits suicide as well. So a lot of the active duty people who are in the room right now think they're, they're safe. Once you exit the military, your, your uh, chances go way up. Uh, and regardless of the 900 anti-suicide programs that are currently out there, 2012 had the highest suicide rate in the military. So something's not working, right? Something's not working there. Uh, Babies, in my opinion, babies are not born with suicidal tendencies. You know, they laugh, they giggle. Yet, if you fast forward 20, 25 years later, once they enter the military, something happens. There's a shift. Something happens, right? Where they become either depressed and, uh, you know, may, may or may not commit suicide. And instead of focusing on the act of suicide, how they kill themselves, gun or hanging or whatever, I chose to focus on what caused them to become suicidal in the first place, right? What caused that suicidal ideation? Because I don't care, you could cover everything in styrofoam and make it impossible to kill yourself. If you have suicidal thoughts, that is the real problem, in my opinion, okay? Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking here, what causes a healthy person to develop suicidal thoughts? So last night, I happened to have a few drinks with an old buddy of mine I worked in Iraq with. And because of my research paper, for some reason, he thinks I'm a PTSD slash uh, military suicide guru. So he confided in me after a few drinks. And he basically said uh, that while he was in Iraq, this is a good guy, family man, kids and all that. While he was in Iraq, there was a day after 12 months of working under toxic leadership, 
getting into physical alterations with his uh, chain of command and so forth, that there was one day when he said, tomorrow I'm going to go into the skiff, I'm going to take my gun out and kill everybody. He literally said that to me last night. And the next day he was walking to work, planning to do that, and the only thing that stopped him is somebody who was walking the other direction said, good morning, literally, sincerely said good morning, and that snapped him, up, snapped him out of it, and he said, I can't do this. I got kids. I, I got I to gotta look beyond this. Right? So what caused this family man to think, I'm going to kill everybody in my office and then kill myself? That is what we're going to try in, in this group anyway. What causes that shift from healthy to unhealthy mindset for suicidal ideation? Um, planning to just basically ideate a few solutions and try to isolate uh, isolate some, some primary variables that could possibly, uh, I don't want to say poison the mindset of a healthy person, but that could cause somebody to shift, make that mental shift from, I want to be part of this group and help everyone move in the, to protect the country and help the greater good, to I'm going to do something that's really, really bad. And uh, this was the only way that he felt that somebody would listen to him, right? Because he had nobody would listen to him. So uh, we're going to use the design thinking process and the ideation series, which all of us and all the groups are going to use. And that's basically what I'll be working on, if you want to be part of this group. Great. Thanks, John. Yep. All right. Next up is uh, Nate Finney and Joe Byerly about reforming PME. All right. Well, uh, while Nate and I are introducing this topic, since we have the, the Twitter wall behind us, just encourage you to think about an experience you've had within our professional military education system, good or bad, just, uh, just throw it up there. But it, every, every person in the military in here has been a product of our military education system, whether it's your pre-commissioning source or, uh, or basic training, uh, captain's career course, uh, basic officer leader course, whatever. Um, and, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, good experiences, but there's also a lot of bad. And, and both Nate and I feel like there's a lot that can be done uh, to, uh, to make it better. And so uh, we're going to use this, uh, this opportunity in this ideation group to just come up with some, uh, some basic approaches, some, some uh, things that we can incorporate, whether it's through, uh, through instructor selection, uh, standards, or even uh, accountability within courses. But uh, ideas along those lines to, uh, to try to make our, our military education system, which is the, uh, you know, one of the bedrocks of uh, leader development within the military, uh, e even stronger. Nate? Be really interested in seeing Joe and I are both Army guys, so I'd be really interested in getting a lot of folks, particularly from other services, to come in, give their experience in their PME um, courses, so that we can actually maybe create uh, a better idea of the PME system as a whole. So, thanks, appreciate it, guys. Look forward to working with you. All right, next up is uh, Mr. Jeff Windham talking about acquisition reform. Okay, thank you. Um, acquisition system in DOD is badly broken. Uh, when I say acquisition, I mean anything related to designing new equipment, building equipment, supporting ex existing equipment, or disposing of old equipment. The whole system is completely dysfunctional. If you look back over the last 20 years, I cannot think of a single program, large or small, that has been successful. And by successful, I mean met the warfighter's needs on time or within budget. <laughs> Large or small, I can't think of a single one. And it's because our acquisition process and organization is completely dysfunctional, is orders of magnitude more complex than it needs to be, and that's part of the problem. So that's what we're gonna try to tackle in this group. Thank you. Just a small task. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, Lindsay Rodden with a 21st century personnel system. Hi, so I'm Captain Lindsay Rodman. I'm a judge advocate in the United States Marine Corps. I currently work on the Joint Staff. Um, and my small task is to reform for a 21st century personnel system. Um, how many of you have ever been promoted and maybe had some opinions about how that process happened? How many of you have ever PCS and thought, I have some opinions about how this might be done better? How many of you have benefits for your spouses or children? How many of you don't get benefits because you don't have spouses or children? Um, how many of you see bonuses and incentives in the way that they're structured and have thought to yourself, 
I'm not sure that we're pairing these with the real needs of my service. Um, how many of you have thought about retirement? These are the issues that we deal with on a daily basis, and my goal is to try to whittle down to some real proposed problems and then pair those with solutions. So we really need to do some problem definition and solutions. <coughs> this is going to be a catch-all because there's no one proposal in mind. So um, I, I really look forward to seeing people's ideas. Um, and uh, I will add that I've heard some stuff this morning already on this topic. So I know that we, lots of people have thrown out Tim Kaine's book and about whether we're sort of retaining the right type of talent or whether we have some sort of brain drain going on. Um, those are issues that we can tackle. And finally, I know during PJ's speech we talked about, um, well, what are the legal and regulatory constraints within which we're working? I'm facilitating and I'm a lawyer, so um, we're going to be able to work through those things and I really look forward to hearing your ideas and finding some great solutions. Thanks, Lizzie. Next up is uh, Mark Jacobson talking about building an I DOD idea pipeline. All right, how's it going? So before I get into my topic, I want to answer a question that appeared on Twitter real quick. Uh, Nick asked, are we supposed to assume that we're s the solution that we're starting with is the right solution or not? Uh, those are two different paths. That's right. And actually, we've had very vigorous debates and discussions among the deaf board about what's the right utility of these groups. We start with problems. We start with a tentative solution. And ultimately, we had a different perspectives. We we're leaving it up to the teams individually on what they think the best way forward is. So each team should be spending a lot of time looking at the problem. Um, and maybe that will require a reformulation of, of the topic and where it's going. But we're leaving it to each team because we've got the opportunity here to do an, a bunch of experiments and see, well, where's the really the value going to come in? So these are the things to talk about in your teams. It's going to be up to each facilitator and each team exactly how they want to take this idea forward. So um, now, all the ideas so far have been specific idea proposals or things we've discussed on our idea form online. And as we were discussing what the value is in these groups, I spent a lot of time asking myself, um, what's the most value we can get out of DEF this week? Uh, we've got about 100 people here who are passionate about innovation. They're true believers. They pay a lot of money to come here on their own dime. Uh, that's where our value is. And I started thinking about what can we do to promote innovation? That's kind of our core competency here. And I also started looking at private corporations, large organizations that are successful innovators, and how do they work? Um, and what I found, which really should not be surprising, is that innovation does not happen on its own. Uh, really successful large organizations have strategies for innovation. It's something they build into their values, their culture, their processes, their HR systems, their hiring, their promotions. Uh, they have idea management systems, so when ideas bubble up from the bottom, they get put in systems and tracked, people can collaborate on them collaborate on them in online workspaces. Uh, senior leaders and mid-level managers have dashboards where they can see what kind of innovation is happening in organizations. Um, and a big part of that is just defining what their goals are. What kind of innovations does that company need? It's going to be different for every company. So successful innovative companies have innovation frameworks or architectures that are a blueprint for how they want to do innovation. Uh, we don't really have anything like that in the DoD. So I talked to Ben about my idea of Let's get several of these groups to work together on what would an innovation framework for the DoD look like? How can we make sure that innovation isn't just 100 uh, motivated people in this room, but we can try and build the very tools we want to take out into the military and, and employ uh, to scale innovation uh, in the workplace? Um, every person in this room is an innovation catalyst. Um, we're all going to go forth, back to our home units, and hopefully try and create change. And that's not just pushing our own ideas, but that's helping people around us innovate and helping build those kind of processes into our home units. So the goal of the next four groups is to build the very tools that we can take with us back to our home units. Um, each group's got a different piece of this puzzle, and they're going to work together, uh, mostly independently, but they're all kind of taking different pieces of this to build towards some ideas uh, of how we can do this. Uh, the first group is mine. Um, build an idea pipeline. If you want innovation, you need a lot of ideas. Because honestly, most ideas will not be that good. Um, it's no secret in the private sector that if you're, a, um, uh, if you're an entrepreneur or an investor, you're going to invest in a lot of different projects. And maybe 80% of those are going to fail. Maybe 15%, 18% will be OK. You have marginal returns. And the 1% or 2% is what you're looking for, the ones that are just going to be knockout hits. 
we need a lot of ideas, and we need to draw those out of our people. We can't wait for ideas to come to us. So that's what I'll be looking at in my group. Where can we get ideas from? How do we draw them out of our people? Um, other groups, which you'll hear about in a minute, are going to look at what's the role for managing ideas for supervisors and to um, what are the processes we need to kind of sift through those ideas, pick the good ones, run experiments. The third group's going to look at culture and HR. How do we hire? How do we promote? What are the things we can do to create a culture of innovation? I think as Howard said uh, earlier that you know, we can create the conditions in which innovation can happen. Uh, and that's what that group is about. And then the last group will be uh, looking at the future of deaf, because we believe that there's always going to be a need for grassroots organizations like this. Um, for those who choose to participate in these groups, I want you to think about this in kind of three levels. The first one would be, if you're writing to the chief of staff of your service, what would you recommend for an innovation framework from the top down? Ideally, that's how this would happen. Second one is, what can each person in this room take back to their unit at their level. It's going to be on a small scale, but what can you do within your unit? And then the, the third one would be, what could you promote a couple levels above you? Maybe an installation innovation program in your wing or your battalion or whatever. Um, that's kind of what we're aiming at in these groups. So I hope you'll uh, consider attending. And with that, I'll give it over to uh, Michael Bob. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Michael Bob Starr. And let's, uh, first thing, you heard that right. I go by Michael Bob. Any shortened version is fine. MB, M Bob. That's from that's because I'm from Oklahoma, where we use all our names, especially if one of them is Bob <laughs> or Joe. And if you're lucky enough to be named Joe Bob and live in Oklahoma, you can pretty much do whatever you want to. The sky's absolutely the limit. But uh, and, and, I, and I think we're losing to Texas. Has anybody got the latest score? It's not not good. Anyway, the. Uh, Let's say that you, you, so Mark's group is going to work on generating ideas and making sure we can get a bunch of good ideas. Let's say you've done that, and we, we do a great job of that. We, we get all kinds of really innovative ideas. You've, you've probably done some disruption. You've undoubtedly done some thinking, but you haven't really changed anything yet. To change something, especially something as big as the DOD, you have to have a way, a, a process for identifying the, the best ideas, for managing those, for resourcing them, and then, and then following along the way, which means they have to be incorporated into the, the formal structures uh, of the process. True for DOD, true for any large organization. Now, imagine, if you will, that Secretary Hagel is watching the feed, and he goes, I like that. I want this. I, I want this, this innovation stuff. So he sends out a memo to all the departments and said, everybody's going to innovate. And we're going we're gonna to stand up a deputies management action group, and we're going to report on this quarterly. OK, that might be a little plausible. How many, raise your hand if you think that results in the kind of changes that, that we're after by coming to this conference. Not a hand in the room going up. So you have to think innovatively about a way to foster innovative innovation in, in a large organization. So that's what this group is going to be doing. So if you have any, it, I'm looking for some specific people. If, uh, if you have any experience in an organization that's done this on a large scale, you know, I'd, I'd love to have some folks from the CNO uh, Rapid Initi Initiatives uh, Group. I don't know how many of those we have here. I know uh, Air Mobility Command in the Air Force has some experience with this. Uh, I'm certain there are other large organizations that, that have also uh, tried this. And, and so succeed or fail, I think it's important to get those perspectives. If you studied it in an academic environment or an academic kind of context, thought about it, those are the kind of people I like in, in the last group is anybody that has and uses two names. You're welcome in my group. Thanks. Uh, ben Taylor. Good afternoon, I'm Ben Taylor. Um, I, I wrote my master's thesis on military innovation and how it relates to uh, US global, uh, or US power status in, in, the, in the globe. And I tell you that, just stay up here. There, yeah. <laughs> I, I tell you that because uh, <laughs> I tell you that because um, you know it's uh, not just to offer my bona fides, but to say you know, like everybody in this room, I'm, I'm a true believer here. More importantly, I think because um, you know my conclusion was basically that if we don't innovate as a military, we run the risk of actually losing global power status. Um, you know, you can look at histories throughout, or examples throughout history that'll prove that, that point. Um, bottom line, is, as I'm preaching to the choir here, is the stakes are high. We all know that. Um, we've, we've had discussions here this morning about, you know, drawing lessons from business and, and what, are the, what are the constraints on those lessons? Where, where do business models apply and where they don't? Um, how to innovate the system versus innovate at the, 
at the lower level. Um, it, it all, I think, kind of can be wrapped up somewhat in the, uh, the idea of an innovation balance. There has to be an innovation balance in the military. And I think the thing that offers that balance is leadership. Um, I think what we have to have is leaders in a culture of innovation who are able to make that balance and make those decisions from the tactical level to the strategic level. So my, my group is about creating a culture of innovation in the military. Um, so we will be uh, somewhat fuzzy. If you're comfortable operating in the fuzzy area of how do you uh, change a climate and change a culture, then, uh, then please come join my group. Thanks. Then last, but I certainly hope not least, the future of deaf. So all y'all are here. We have the first conference. We just keep it like this. What do we do? What's the future? What does the grassroots want? Tony and myself could certainly shape a future, but it's only going to work if y'all are involved and want something to happen. So in my group, we'll be discussing this, coming with a long-term framework for kind of an outside DOD organization that's going to bring in people from across the services and across the, the civilian sector to figure out where does deaf go from here. All right, next steps. I'm going to put up on the screen here momentarily the, group, the, the, the room names and the uh, locations. So please self-select. We'll shoot for eight to 10 person teams. Um, we can envision, say, a PME or something like that having 20, 25. That's OK. We'll see what it hashes out to. We may break, break groups up into multiple groups of the same topic. But please go to the group you want to. If we have to shuffle around a little bit, we will. We'll begin uh, formal ideation at 2.10. And then facilitators, please be back here no later than 4.30. You'll get more details from your facilitation guides. They'll give you the framework, what we're shooting for as an end result, and then go through the process. So uh, have at it. Choose your group. We'll see where we go. Yeah. Let's have the team leads.
take your seats, please. We'll get started with the uh, meat of the afternoon. Uh, we have a happy hour from 6 to 8, and we'll flash it up on the screen. Yeah. Okay, so I hope you guys enjoy lunch, uh, thanks to the Chicago School of Business uh, Catering Department. Um, what we're going to do this afternoon is kind of the meat of the conference. So we spent the, the morning kind of talking about disruptive thinking, innovation, learning from some experts in the field. Now we're going to take that and actually apply it. What we've done over the past couple months is through our crowdsource website, through other ideas that have been submitted to us, we've narrowed it down to nine specific ideas that we're going to focus on today. So how many of you have been to Startup Weekend events before? Anybody here? So the, the afternoons for two or three hours each are going to be kind of modeled on that. It's a little bit different in the sense that they're actually going to have like a, they, they would probably have like an app or something that could be sold. But what we want to have by Monday morning for our pitch panel is a deliverable that we can present on specific ideas to the panel of judges. Along with that, you'll get more details from your facilitator. It's a two to three, two to three page white paper about what your idea is, what your group came up with, and we're going to basically self-select into these groups. Um, the goal here is to take an idea, create an action plan around it, identify some of the antibodies that might come in and try to squash it, figure out a way to actually implement it, and then have something to go forth with. And if it's, if it's a compelling enough idea, you know, after death ends, have something you can take and do, and do something with in a self-organized way. So uh, Mark Jacobson, one of our uh, board members, has been working very hard over the past couple weeks to develop the, the, the framework. He's met with the facilitation lead, so there's nine of them, to talk to them about be facilitation best practices <coughs> and those going. Um, but what's going to happen is right now we're going to invite all these guys up to talk about their particular idea. So basically a three to four minute pitch on what they want to accomplish. And you, after this, will self-select into those groups and spend about two and a half hours today going through the initial brainstorming process, coming up with ideas, and figuring out a framework so that tomorrow you come back and actually put meat on that, on those ideas, and then go forth with it. Um, so Mark, do you want to add anything more about the concept or what we're looking to do here? Uh, no, not right now. I'll talk in a minute. So Esteban, are you right? Yeah. Feel free to chat about your idea and inform your team. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Esteban Castellanos. I am uh, a reservist. I left active duty about a year and a half ago. Um, and in my last year and a half of soul searching what to do next, um, I kind of stumbled upon this idea, uh, which is how great it would have been uh, for me, I think, to have had an opportunity to have an externship while I was in the Air Force. So the Air Force has a lot of professional development programs that uh, are expected of most uh, young officers. are supposed to go to squadron officer school, which is like a four to six week long program where you learn a lot of like team building skills. But what you don't walk away with is it any idea of how to bring your great ideas and being all fired up about some way in which you can change 